Romeo and Juliet, Act 3. No Fear Shakespeare, Act 3, Scene 1. Mercutio, his page, and Benvolio enter with other men. I'm begging you, good Mercutio, let's call it a day. It's hot outside, and the Capulets are wandering around. If we bump into them, we'll certainly get into a fight. When it's hot outside, people become angry and hot-blooded. You're like one of those guys who walks into a bar, slams his sword on the table, and then says, I pray I never have to use you. By the time he orders his second drink, he pulls his sword on the bartender for no reason at all. Am I really like one of those guys? Come on! You can be as angry as any guy in Italy when you're in the mood. When someone does the smallest thing to make you angry, you get angry. And when you're in the mood to get angry, you find something to get angry about. And what about that? If there were two men like you, pretty soon there'd be none because the two of you would kill each other. You would fight with a man if he had one more whisker or one less whisker in his beard than you have in your beard. You'll fight with a man who's cracking nuts just because you have hazelnut-colored eyes. Only you would look for a fight like that. Your head is as full of fights as an egg is full of yolk, but your head has been beaten like scrambled eggs for so much fighting. You started a fight with a man who coughed in the street because he woke up a dog that was sleeping in the sun. Didn't you argue it out with your tailor for wearing one of his new suits before the right season? And with another for tying the new shoes he made with old laces? And yet you're the one who wants to teach me about restraint. If I were in the habit of fighting the way you are, my life insurance rates would be sky high. Your life insurance? <sighs> That's foolish. Tibalt, Petruchio, and Capulet enter. Oh, great. Here come the Capulets. Well, well, I don't care. Tybalt, to Petruchio and others. Follow me closely. I'll talk to them. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I'd like to have a word with one of you. You just want one word with one of us? Put it together with something else. Make it a word and a blow. You'll find me ready enough to do that, sir, if you give me a reason. Can't you find a reason without my giving you one? Bacuccio, you hang out with Romeo. Hang out? Who do you think we are, musicians in a band? If we look like musicians, you, you can expect to hear nothing but noise. This is my fiddlestick. I'll use it to make you dance. God damn it. Hang out. Well, we're talking here in a public place. Either go someplace private or talk it over rationally. Or else just go away. Out here, everybody can see us. Men's eyes were made to see things, so let them watch. I won't move to please anybody. Romeo enters. Well, may peace be with you. Here comes my man, the man I'm looking for. He's not your man. All right. Walk out into a field, and he'll chase you. In that sense, you can call him your man. Romeo, there's only one thing I can call you. You're a villain. Tibal, I have a reason to love you. That lets me put aside the rage I should feel and excuse that insult. I am no villain, so goodbye. I can tell that you don't know who I am. Boy, your words can't excuse the harm you've done to me. So now turn and draw your sword. I disagree. I've never done your harm. I love you more than you can understand until you know the reason why I love you. And so, good Capulet, which is a name I love like my own, you should be satisfied with what I say. This calm submission is dishonorable and vile. The thrust of a sword will end the surrender. Tybalt, you rat catcher, will you go fight me? What do you want from me? Good king of cats, I want to take one of your nine lives. I'll take one, and depending on how you treat me after that, I might beat the other eight out of you, too. Will you pull your sword out of its sheath? Hurry up, or I'll smack you on the ears with my sword before you have yours drawn. I'll fight you! He draws his sword. Nomo Mercutio, put your sword away. Come on, sir, perform your forward thrust, your pasado. Mercutio and Tybalt fight. Drawing his sword. Draw your sword, Benvolio. Let's beat down their weapons. Gentlemen, stop this disgraceful fight. Tybalt, Mercutio, the prince has banned fighting in the streets of Verona. Stop, Tybalt. Stop. 
good Marcuccio. <laughs> Romeo tries to break up the fight. Tybalt reaches under Romeo's arm and stabs Mercutio. Let's get away, Tybalt! Tybalt, Petruchio, and the other Capulets exit. I've been hurt! May a plague curse both your families! I'm finished! Did he get away clean? What? Are you hurt? Yes! Yes! It's a scratch! Just a scratch! But it's enough! Where's my page? Go! Boy, give me a doctor. Mercutio's page exits. Have courage, man. The wound can't be that bad. No, it's not as deep as a well or as wide as a church door, but it's enough. It'll do the job. Ask for me tomorrow and you'll find me in a grave. I'm done for in this world, I believe. May a plague strike both your houses. God damn it. I can't believe that dog, that rat, that mouse, that cat could scratch me to death. That braggart, a punk villain who fights like he learned swordsmanship from a manual. Why the hell did you come in between us? He struck me from under your arm. I thought it was the right thing to do. Take me inside some house, Benvolio, or I'll pass out. May a plague strike both your families. They've turned me into food for worms. I'm done. I'm done for. Curse your families. Mercutio and Benvolio exit. This gentleman, Mercutio, a close relative of the prince, and my dear friend, was killed while defending me from Tybalt's slander. Tybalt, who had been my cousin for a whole hour. Oh, sweet Juliet, your beauty has made me weak like a woman, and you have softened my bravery, which before was as hard as steel. Benvolio enters. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, brave Mercutio is dead. His brave spirit has floated up to heaven, but it was too early for him to leave life on earth. The future will be affected by today's terrible events. Today is the start of a terror that will end in the days ahead. Tybalt enters. Here comes the furious Tybalt back again. He's alive and victorious, and Mercutio is dead? Enough with mercy and consideration. It's time for rage to guide my actions. Now, Tybalt, you can call me a villain the way you did before. Mercutio's soul is floating right above our heads. He's waiting for you to keep him company on the way up to heaven. Either you or I or both of us have to go with him. Wretched boy, you hung out with him here, and you're going to go to heaven with him. This fight will decide who dies. They fight. Tybalt falls and dies. <coughs> Romeo, get out of here. The citizens are around, and Tybalt is dead. Don't stand there shocked. The prince will give you the death penalty if you get caught. So get out of here. Oh, I have awful luck. Why are you waiting? Romeo exits. The citizens of the watch enter. The man who killed Mercutio, which way did he go? Tybalt, that murderer, which way did he run? Tybalt is lying over there. Get up, sir, and come with me. I command you, by the authority of the prince, to obey me. The prince enters with Montagu, Capulet, Lady Montagu, Lady Capulet, and others. Where are the evil men who started this fight? Oh, noble prince, I can tell you everything about the unfortunate circumstances of this deadly fight. Over there, Tybalt is lying dead. He killed your relative, brave Mercutio, and then young Romeo killed him. Tybalt. Tybalt was my nephew. He was my brother's son. Oh, prince, oh, nephew, oh, husband. Oh, my nephew is dead. Oh, prince, as you are a man of honor, take revenge for this murderer by killing someone from the Montagu family. Oh, cousin, cousin. Benvolio, who started this fight? Tybalt started the fight before he was killed by Romeo. Romeo spoke to Tybalt politely and told him how silly this argument was. He mentioned that you would not approve of the fight. He said all of this gently and calmly, kneeling down out of respect. But he could not make peace with Tybalt, who was in an angry mood and wouldn't listen to talk about peace. Tybalt and Mercutio began to fight each other fiercely, lunging at one another and dodging each other's blows. Romeo cried out, Stop! My friend, break it up! Then he jumped in between them and forced them to put down their swords. 
But Tybalt reached under Romeo's arm and thrust his sword into brave Mercutio. Then Tybalt fled the scene. But pretty soon he came back to meet Romeo, who was overcome with a desire for revenge. As quick as lightning, they started fighting. Before I could break up the fight, Tybalt was killed. Romeo ran away when Tybalt fell dead. I'm telling you the truth. I swear on my life. Benvolio is part of the Montagu family. His loyalties to the Montagus make him tell lies. He's not telling the truth. There were twenty Montagus fighting in this awful riot, and together those twenty could only kill one man. I demand justice. You, Prince, are the man who can give me justice. Romeo killed Tybalt. Romeo must die. Romeo killed Tybalt. Tybalt killed Mercutio. Who should now pay the price for Mercutio's life? Not Romeo, Prince. He was Mercutio's friend. His crime did justice's job by taking Tybalt's life. And for that crime, Romeo is hereby exiled from Verona. I'm involved in your rivalry. Mercutio was my relative, and he lies dead because of your bloody feud. I'll punish you so harshly that you'll regret causing me this loss. I won't listen to your pleas or excuses. You can't get out of trouble by praying or crying, so don't bother. Tell Romeo to leave the city immediately, or else, if he is found, he will be killed. Take away this body and do what I say. Showing mercy by pardoning killers only causes more murderers. They exit. Act 3, Scene 2 Juliet enters alone. I wish the sun would hurry up and set and night would come immediately. When the night comes and everyone goes to sleep, Romeo will leap into my arms and no one will know. Beauty makes it possible for lovers to see how to make love in the dark, or else love is blind, and its best time is the night. I wish night would come, like a widow dressed in black, so I can learn how to submit to my husband and lose my virginity. Let the blood rushing to my cheeks be calmed. In the darkness, let me, a shy virgin, learn the strange act of sex so that it seems innocent, modest, and true. Come, night. Come, Romeo. You're like a day that comes during the night. You're whiter than snow on the black wings of a raven. Come, gentle night. Come, loving dark night. Give me my Romeo, and when I die... Turn him into stars and form a constellation in his image. His face will make the heavens so beautiful that the world will fall in love with the night and forget about the garish sun. Oh, I have bought love's mansion, but I haven't moved in yet. I belong to Romeo now, but he hasn't taken possession of me yet. This day is so boring that I feel like a child on the night before a holiday, waiting to put on my fancy new clothes. The nurse enters with the rope ladder in her pouch. Oh, here comes my nurse, and she brings news. Every voice that mentions Romeo's name sounds beautiful. Now, nurse, what's the news? Is that the rope ladder Romeo told you to pick up? Yes, yes, this is the rope ladder. Oh, my, what's the news? Why do you look so upset? Oh, it's a sad day. He's dead, he's dead, he's dead. We're ruined, lady. We're ruined. What an awful day. He's gone. He's been killed. He's dead. Can God be so jealous and hateful? Romeo is hateful, even though God isn't. Oh, Romeo, Romeo. Whoever would have thought it would be Romeo. What kind of devil are you to torture me like this? This is as bad as the tortures of hell. Has Romeo killed himself? Just say yes, and I will turn more poisonous than the snake with the evil eye. I will no longer be myself if you tell me Romeo killed himself. If he's been killed, say yes. If not, say no. These short words will determine my joy or my pain. I saw the wound. I saw it with my own eyes. God bless that wound here on his manly chest. A pitiful corpse. A bloody pitiful corpse. Pale as ashes and drenched in blood. All the drenched blood was so gory. I fainted when I saw it. Oh, my heart is breaking. Oh, my bankrupt heart is breaking. I'll send my eyes to prison, and they'll never be free to look at anything again. I'll give my vile body back to the earth. I'll never move again. My body and Romeo's will lie together in one sad coffin. Oh, Tybalt, Tybalt, he was the best friend I had. Oh, polite Tybalt, he was an honorable gentleman. I wish I had not lived long enough to see him die. 
What disaster is this? Has Romeo been killed and is Tybalt dead too? Tybalt was my dearest cousin. Romeo was even dearer to me as my husband. Let the trumpets play the song of doom, because who can be alive if those two are gone? Tybalt is dead, and Romeo has been banished. Romeo killed Tybalt, and his punishment was banishment. Oh, God! Did Romeo's hand shed Tybalt's blood? It did! It did! Curse the day this happened, but it did! Oh, he's like a snake disguised as a flower. Did a dragon ever hide in such a beautiful cave? He's a beautiful tyrant and a fiendish angel. He's a raven with the feathers of the dove. He's a lamb who hunts like a wolf. I hate him, yet he seems the most wonderful man. He's turned out to be the exact opposite of what he seemed. He's a saint who should be damned. He's a villain who seemed honorable. Oh, nature, what were you doing in hell? Why did you put the soul of a criminal in the perfect body of a man was there ever such an evil book with such a beautiful cover oh i can't believe the deepest evil lurks inside something so beautiful there is no trust no faith no honesty in men all of them lie all of them cheat they're all wicked oh where's my servant give me some brandy these griefs these pains these sorrows make me old shame on romeo I hope sores cover your tongue for a wish like that. He was not born to be shameful. Shame does not belong with Romeo. He deserves only honor, complete honor. Oh, I was such a beast to be angry at him. Are you going to say good things about the man who killed your cousin? Am I supposed to say bad things about my own husband? Oh, my poor husband, who will sing your praises when I, your wife of three hours, have been saying awful things about you. But why, you villain, did you kill my cousin? Probably because my cousin, the villain, would have killed my husband. I'm not going to cry any tears. I would cry with joy that Romeo is alive, but I should cry tears of grief because Tybalt is dead. My husband, whom Tybalt wanted to kill, is alive. Tybalt, who wanted to kill my husband, is dead. All, All this is comforting news. Why then should I cry? There is news worse than the news that Tybalt is dead news that makes me want to die. I would be glad to forget about it, but it weighs on my memory like sin's lingering guilty mind. Tybalt is dead and Romeo has been banished. That banishment is worse than the murder of ten thousand Tybalts. Tybalt's death would be bad enough if that was all. Maybe pain likes to have company and can't come without bringing more pain. It would have been better if, after she said, Tybalt's dead, she told me my mother or my father or both were gone. That would have made me make the normal cries of sadness. But to say that Tybalt's dead and then say Romeo has been banished? To say that is like saying that my father, my mother, Tybalt, Romeo, and Juliet have all been killed. They're all dead. Romeo has been banished. That news brings infinite death. No words can express the pain. Where are my father and mother, nurse? They are crying and moaning over Tybalt's corpse. Are you going to join them? I'll bring you there. Are they washing out his wounds with their tears? I'll cry my tears for Romeo's banishment when their tears are dry. Pick up this rope ladder. This poor rope ladder. It's useless now, just like me, because Romeo has been exiled. He made this rope ladder to be a highway to my bed, but I'm a virgin, and I will die a virgin and a widow. Let's go, rope ladder. Nurse, I'm going to lie in my wedding bed, and death, not Romeo, can take my virginity. Go to your bedroom. I'll find Romeo to comfort you. I know where he is. Listen, your Romeo will be here tonight. I'll go to him. He's hiding out in Friar Lawrence's cell. Oh, find him. Give this ring to my true knight and tell him to come here to say his last goodbye. Act 3. Scene 3. Friar Lawrence enters. Romeo, come out. Come out, you frightened man. Trouble likes you, and you're married to disaster. Romeo enters. Father, what's the news? What punishment did the prince announce? What suffering lies in store for me that I don't know about yet? You know too much about suffering. I have news for you about the prince's punishment. Is the prince's punishment any less awful than Doomsday? He made a gentler decision. You won't die, but you'll be banished from the city. <laughs> banishment? Be merciful and say death. Exile is much worse than death. Don't say banishment. From now on, you are banished from Verona. You should be able to endure this because the world is broad and wide. 
There is no world for me outside the walls of Verona except purgatory, torture, and hell itself. So to be banished from Verona is like being banished from the world, and being banished from the world is death. Banishment is death by the wrong name. Calling death banishment is like cutting off my head with a golden axe and smiling when I'm being murdered. Oh, deadly sin! Oh, rude and unthankful boy! You committed a crime that is punishable by death, but our kind prince took sympathy on you and ignored the law when he substituted banishment for death. This is kind mercy, and you don't realize it. It's torture, not mercy. Heaven is here because Julia lives here. Every cat and dog and little mouse, every unworthy animal that lives here can see her, but Romeo can't. Flies are healthier and more honorable and better suited for romance than Romeo. They can take hold of Juliet's wonderful white hand and they can kiss her sweet lips. Even while she remains a pure virgin, she blushes when her lips touch each other because she thinks it's a sin. But Romeo can't kiss her or hold her hand because he's banished. Flies can kiss her, but I must flee the city. Flies are like free men, but I have been banished. And yet you say that exile is not death? Did you have no poison, no sharp knife, no weapon you could use to kill me quickly? Nothing so disgraceful except banishment? Oh, friar... Damn souls use the word banishment to describe hell. They howl about banishment. If you're a member of a divine spiritual order of men who forgive sins and you say you're my friend, how do you have the heart to mangle me with the word banishment? You foolish madman, listen to me for a moment. Oh, you're just going to talk about banishment again. I'll give you protection from that word. I'll give you the antidote for trouble. Philosophy. Philosophy will comfort you even though you've been banished. You're still talking about banished? Forget about philosophy. Unless philosophy can create a Julia or pick up a town and put it somewhere else or reverse a prince's punishment, it doesn't do me any good. Don't say anything else. Oh, so madmen like you are also deaf. How should madmen hear if wise men can't even see? Let me talk to you about your situation. You can't talk about something that you don't feel. If you were as young as I am, if you were in love with Juliet, if you had just married her an hour ago, if then you murdered Tabal, if you were lovesick like me, and if you were banished, then you might talk about it. You might also tear your hair out of your head and collapse to the ground the way I'll do right now. <sighs> You might kneel down and measure the grave that hasn't yet been dug. Get up. Somebody's knocking. Hide yourself, good Romeo. I won't hide unless all the mist from my heart sick groans and envelops me like a fog and conceals me from people's searching eyes. Listen, they're still knocking. Who's there? Romeo, get up. They'll arrest you. Ho hold on. Hold on. Get up. Run and hide in my study. Just a minute. For the love of God, why are you being so stupid? I'm coming. I'm coming. Why are you knocking so hard? Where do you come from? What do you want? Let me come in. Let me come in and I'll tell you why I came. I come from Lady Juliet. Welcome then. The nurse enters. Oh, Holy Friar. Oh, tell me. Holy Friar, where is my lady's husband? Where's Romeo? He's there on the ground. He's been getting drunk on his own tears. Oh, he's acting just like Juliet, just like her. Oh, painful sympathy. What a pitiful problem. She's lying on the ground just like him, blubbering and weeping, weeping and blubbering. Stand up, stand up, stand up if you're really a man. For Juliet's sake, for her sake, rise and stand up. Why should you fall into so deep a moan? Nurse! Ah, sir. Ah, sir. Well, death is the end for everybody. Were you talking about Juliet? How is she? Does she think that I'm a practice murderer because I tainted our newfound joy by killing one of her close relatives? Where is she? How is she doing? What does my hidden wife say about our ruined love? Oh, she doesn't say anything, sir. She just weeps and weeps. She falls on her bed and then starts to get up. Then she calls out Tybalt's name and cries, Romeo! And then she falls down again. 
She's calling out my name as if I were a bullet murdering her, just like I murdered her relatives. Tell me, Frere, in what part of my body is my name embedded? Tell me so I can cut it out of myself. He draws his dagger. Hold on, and don't act out of desperation. Are you a man? You look like a man, but your tears make you look like a woman. Your wild actions resemble the irrational fury of a beast. You're a shameful woman who looks like a man, or else an ugly creature who's half man, half beast. You have amazed me. I swear by my holy order. I thought you were smarter and more rational than this. Have you killed Tibalt? Will you kill yourself? And would you also kill your wife who shares your life by committing the sin of killing yourself? Why do you complain about your birth, the heavens, and earth? Life is the union of a soul and body through the miracle of birth, but you would throw all that away? You bring shame to your body, your love, and your mind. You have so much natural talent, but like someone who hoards money, you use none of your talent for the right purpose. Not your body, not your love, not your mind. Your body is just a wax figure without the honor of a man. The love that you promised was a hollow lie. You're killing the love that you vowed to cherish. Your mind, which aids both your body and your love, has mishandled both of them. You're like a stupid soldier whose gunpowder explodes because he's careless. The things you were supposed to use to defend yourself end up killing you. Get up, man! Your Julian is alive! It was for her that you were almost killed earlier. Be happy that she's alive. Tabal wanted to kill you, but you killed Tabal. Be happy that you're alive. The law that threatened your life was softened into exile. Be happy about that. Your life is full of blessings. You have the best sorts of happiness to enjoy. But like a misbehaved, sullen girl, you're whining about your bad luck and your love. Listen, listen. People who act like that die miserable. Go be with your love, as it was decided at your wedding. Climb up to her bedroom and comfort her. But get out of there before the night watchmen take their positions. Then you will escape to the city of Mantua, where you'll live until we can make your marriage public and make peace between your families. We'll ask the prince to pardon you. Then we'll welcome you back with 20,000 times more joy than you'll have when you leave this town crying. Go ahead, nurse. Give my regards to your lady and tell her to hurry everybody in the house to bed. I'm sure they're all, all so sad that they'll be ready to sleep. Romeo is coming. Oh, Lord, I could stay here all night listening to such good advice. Educated men are so impressive. My Lord, I'll tell my lady you will come. Do so, and tell my sweet to be ready to scold me. Here, sir, this is a ring she asked me to give you. Hurry up, it's getting late. She gives Romeo Juliet's ring. The nurse exits. This makes me feel so much better. Now get out of here. Good night. Everything depends on this. Either be out of here before the night watchmen take their positions or leave in disguise after daybreak. Take a little vacation, Mantua. I'll find your servant, and he'll update you now and then on your case as it stands here. Give me your hand. It's late. Farewell. Good night. I'm off to experience the greatest joy of all, but still it's sad to leave you in such a rush. Farewell. They exit. Act 3. Scene 4. Enter Capulet, Lady Capulet, and Paris. Things have turned out so unlucky, sir, that we haven't had time to convince our daughter to marry you. Listen, she loved her cousin Tybalt dearly, and so did I. Well, we were all born to die. It's very late. She won't be coming downstairs tonight. Believe me, if you weren't here visiting me, I myself would have gone to bed an hour ago. These times of pain are bad times for romance. Madame, good night. Give my regards to your daughter. I will, and I'll find out what she thinks about marriage early tomorrow. Tonight she is shut up in her room, alone with her sadness. Sir Paris, I'll make a desperate argument for my child's love. I think she'll do whatever I say. No, I think she'll do all that and more. I have no doubt about it. Wife, visit her in her room before you go to bed. Tell her about my son Paris's love for her. And tell her, listen to me, on Wednesday. Wait... What day is it today? Monday, my lord. Monday, ha! Huh? Well, Wednesday is too soon. Let it be on Thursday. On Thursday, tell her she'll be married to this noble earl. Will you be ready? Do you think it's a good idea to rush? We shouldn't have too big a celebration. We can invite a friend or two. Listen, because Sibalt was just killed, people might think that we don't care about his memory as our 
relative and we have two grand a party. Therefore, we'll, we'll have about a half a dozen friends to the wedding, and that's it. What do you think about Thursday? My lord, I wish Thursday were tomorrow. Well, go on home. Thursday it is then. To Lady Capulet. Visit Julia before you go to bed. Get her ready, my wife, for this wedding day. To Paris. Farewell, my lord. Now I'm off to bed. Oh my, it's so late that we might as well call it early. Good night. They all exit. Act 3, Scene 5 Romeo and Juliet enter above the stage. Are you going? It's still a long time until daybreak. Don't be afraid. That sound he heard was the nightingale, not the lark. Every night the nightingale chirps on that pomegranate tree. Believe me, my love, it was the nightingale. It was the lark, the bird that sings at dawn, not the nightingale. Look, my love, what are those streaks of light in the clouds parting in the east? Night is over, and day is coming. If I want to live, I must go. If I stay, I'll die. That light is not daylight. I know it. It's some meteor coming out of the sun to light your way to Mantua. So stay for a while. You don't have to go yet. Let me be captured. Let me be put to death. I am content, if that's the way you want it. I'll say the light over there isn't morning. I'll say it's the reflection of the moon. I'll say that sound isn't the lark ringing in the sky. I want to stay more than I want to go. Come, death, and welcome. Juliet wants it this way. How are you, my love? Let's talk. It's not daylight. It is. It is. Get out of here. Be gone. Go away. It's a lark that sings out of tune, making such harsh noise. Some say the lark makes a sweet division between day and night. It's not true because she separates us. Some say the lark traded its eyes with the toad. Oh, now I wish they had traded voices too. Because the lark's voice tears us out of each other's arms and now there will be men hunting for you. Oh, go away now. I see more and more light. More and more light. More and more pain for us. The nurse enters. Madam! Nurse? Your mother is coming to your bedroom. Day has broken. Be careful. Watch out. The nurse exits. Then the window lets day in, and life goes out the window. Farewell, farewell. Give me one kiss, and I'll go down. <laughs> Romeo drops the ladder and goes down. Are you gone like that, my love, my lord? Yes, my husband, my friend, I must hear from you every day in the hour. In a minute there are many days. Oh, by this count I'll be many years older before I see my Romeo again. Farewell, I won't miss any chance to send my love to you. Oh, do you think we'll ever meet again? I have no doubts. All these troubles will give us stories to tell each other later in life. Oh, God, I have a soul that predicts evil things. Now that you are down there, you look like someone dead in the bottom of a tomb. Either my eyesight is failing me, or you look pale. And trust me, love, you look pale to me, too. Sadness takes away our color. Goodbye, goodbye. Romeo exits. Oh, luck, luck, everyone says you can't make up your mind. If you change your mind so much, what are you going to do, Romeo, who's so faithful? Change your mind, luck. I hope maybe then you'll send him back home soon. Hey, daughter, are you awake? Who's that calling? Is it my mother? Isn't she up very late, or is she up very early? What strange reason could she have for coming here? Lady Capula enters. What's going on, Juliet? Madame, I'm not well. Will you cry about your cousin's death forever? Are you trying to wash him out of his grave with tears? If you could, you couldn't bring him back to life, so stop crying. A little bit of grief shows a lot of love, but too much grief makes you look stupid. Let me keep weeping for such a great loss. You will feel the loss, but the man you weep for will feel nothing. Feeling the loss like this, I can't help but weep for him forever. Well, girl, you're weeping not for his death as much as for the fact that the villain who killed him is still alive. What villain, madame? That villain, Romeo. He's far from being a villain. May God pardon him. I do with all my heart, and yet no man could make my heart grieve like he does. That's because the murderer is alive. Yes, madame, he lies beyond my reach. I wish that no one could avenge my cousin's death except me. We'll have revenge for it. Don't worry about that. Stop crying. I'll send a man to Mantua, where that exiled Roge is living. Our man will poison Romeo's drink, and Romeo will join Tybalt in death. And then, I hope, you'll be satisfied. 
I'll never be satisfied with Romeo until I see him. Dead. Dead is how my poor heart feels when I think about my poor cousin. Madame, if you can find a man to deliver the poison, I'll mix it myself so that Romeo will sleep quietly soon after he drinks it. Oh, how I hate to hear people say his name and not be able to go after him. I want to take the love I had for my cousin and take it out on the body of the man who killed him. Find out the way and I'll find the right man. But now I have joyful news for you, girl. And it's good to have joy in such a joyless time. What's the news? Please tell me. Well, well, you have a careful father, child. He has arranged a sudden day of joy to end your sadness, a day that you did not expect and that I did not seek out. Madame, tell me quickly, what day is that? Indeed, my child, at St. Peter's Church early Thursday morning, the gallant young and noble gentleman Count Paris will happily make you a joyful bride. Now, I swear by St. Peter's Church and Peter too, he will not make me a joyful bride there. This is a strange rush. How can I marry him, this husband, before he comes to court me? Please, tell my father, madame, I won't marry yet. And when I do marry, I swear it will be Romeo, whom you know I hate, rather than Paris. That's really news. Here comes your father. Tell him so yourself and see how he takes the news. Capula and nurse enter. When the sun sets, the air drizzles do, but at the death of my brother's son, it rains a downpour. What are you, girl? Some kind of fountain? Why are you still crying? Will you cry forever? In one little body, you seem like a ship, the sea and the winds. Your eyes, which I call the sea, flow with tears. The ship is your body, which is sailing on the salt flood of your tears. The winds are your sighs. Your sighs and your tears are raging. Unless you calm down, tears and sighs will overwhelm your body and sink your ship. So where do things stand, wife? Have you told her our decision? Yes, sir, I told her, but she won't agree. She says, thank you, but refuses. I wish the fool were dead and married to her grave. Wait. Hold on, wife. I don't understand. How can this be? She refuses? Isn't she grateful? Isn't she proud of such a match? Doesn't she realize what a blessing this is? Doesn't she realize how unworthy she is of the gentleman we have found to be her bridegroom? I am not proud of what you have found for me, but I am thankful that you have found it. I can never be proud of what I hate, but I can be thankful for something I hate if it was meant with love. What is this? What is this fuzzy logic? What is this? I hear you say proud and I thank you and then no thank you and not proud. You spoiled little girl. You're not really giving me any thanks or showing me any pride. But get yourself ready for Thursday. You're going to St. Peter's Church to marry Paris. And if you don't go on your own, I'll drag you there. You disgust me, you little bug, you worthless girl, you pale face. Shame on you. What, are you crazy? Good father, I'm begging you on my knees. Be patient and listen to me. Say just one thing. Forget about you, you worthless girl, you disobedient wretch. I'll tell you what, go to church on Thursday or never look me in the face again. Don't say anything. Don't reply. Don't talk back to me. I feel like slapping you. Wife, we never thought ourselves blessed that God only gave us this one child. But now I see that this one is one too many. We were cursed when we had her. She disgusts me, the little hussy. God in heaven bless her. My Lord, you're wrong to berate her like that. And why, wise lady, you shut up, old woman. Go blabber with your gossiping friends. I've said nothing wrong. Oh, for God's sake. Can't I say something? Be quiet, you mumbling fool. Say your serious things at lunch with your gossiping friends. We don't need to hear it. You're getting too angry. God damn it, it makes me mad. Day and night, hour after hour, all the time, at work, at play, alone, in company. My top priority has always been to find her a husband. Now I've provided a husband from a noble family who is good-looking, young, well-educated. He's full of good qualities. He's the man of any girl's dreams. But this wretched, whimpering fool, like a whining puppet, she looks at this good fortune and answers, I won't get married. I can't fall in love. I'm too young. Please, excuse me. Well, if you won't get married, I'll excuse you. Eat wherever you want, but you can no longer live under my roof. Consider that. Think about it. I'm not in the habit of joking. Thursday is coming. Put your hand on your heart and listen to my advice. If you act like my daughter, I'll marry you to my friend. If you don't act like my daughter, you can beg, starve, and die in the street. I swear on my soul, I will never take you back or do anything for you. Believe me, think about it. I won't break this promise. Capulet exits. 
Is there no pity in the sky that can see my sadness? Oh, my sweet mother, don't throw me out. Delay this marriage for a month or a week. Or if you don't delay, make my wedding bed in the tomb where Tibalt lies. Don't talk to me, because I won't say a word. Do as you please, because I'm done worrying about you. Lady Capula exits. Oh, God, oh, nurse, how can this be stopped? My husband is alive on earth. My vows of marriage are in heaven. How can I bring those promises back down to earth unless my husband sends them back down to me by dying and going to heaven? Give me comfort. Give me advice. Oh, no, oh, no. Why does heaven play tricks on someone as weak as me? What do you say? Don't you have one word of joy? Give me some comfort, nurse. This is what I have to say. Romeo has been banished, and it's a sure thing that he will never come back to challenge you. If he does come back, he'll have to sneak back undercover. Then, since things are all the way they are, I think the best thing to do is to marry the Count. Oh, he's a lovely gentleman. Romeo is a dishcloth compared to him. Madame, an eagle does not have eyes as green, as quick, and as fair as the eyes of Paris. Curse my very heart, but I think you should be happy in the second marriage because it's better than your first. Even if it's not better, your first marriage is over. Or if Romeo is as good as Paris, Romeo doesn't live here, so you don't get to enjoy him. Are you speaking from your heart? I speak from my heart and from my soul, too. If not, I curse them both. Amen. What? Well, you have given me great comfort. Go inside and tell my mother that I'm gone. I made my father angry, so I went to Frere Lawrence's cell to confess and be forgiven. All right, I will. This is a good idea. The nurse exits. That damn old lady! Oh, that most wicked fiend! Is it a worse sin for her to want me to break my vows or for her to say bad things about my husband after she praised him so many times before? Away with you and your advice, nurse. From now on, I will never tell you what I feel in my heart. I'm going to the friar to find out his solution. If everything else fails, at least I have the power to take my own life. Juliet exits. 